what a what a lively crowd we have. <laughs> um, let me introduce myself. My name is Joe Houlihan. I am a, a trustee here at the the BRLSI, and I also convene our talks on on the subject of military history, um, which is hence we're doing the collaboration here today with this wonderful event or wonderful event organized by the Nelson Society. Um, to get us started, well, first of all, welcome to everyone, both here and online. And I'm just reminding myself to let our online guests in, otherwise they'll be missing all the fun. Um, yeah, so be, to get us started, welcome to everyone. I'd like to introduce the uh, Deputy Mayor of Bath, uh, Councillor Michelle O'Doherty. Thank you, Joe. Not as tall as you. Some sort of, you know. um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me along today, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And, and thank you all to, for coming to what promises to be a really, really interesting day. Um, I'd also like to congratulate uh, Clive Johnson, who's at the front of our um, of the audience here, on receiving his Mayor of, uh, Mayor of Bath's Guides badge from the Mayor of Bath last, last week, um, along with 17 other new recruits. So congratulations to Clive. And so if you don't, if, for those of you that don't live in Bath, um, the Mayor of Bath has a, a core of uh, guides who do talks, uh, walks around the city. And if you haven't been on one, I would wholly recommend it. And um, they're free, um, but they are, there is an opportunity to donate to the Mayor of Bath's Relief Fund, which is a really important fund in Bath for um, people in need of things like help with school uniforms and bills and furniture and appliances. Um, I believe that there the is an opportunity to donate to the fund um, at when we do our walk later on. So um, if you would like to donate, we'd be very grateful. But it just remains me to say thank you and to hand over to Chris Brett, the chair of the Nelson Society, who will tell you a little bit more about what today has in store for us. Thank you. I wasn't expecting that. I'm going to hand straight over to Joe, who will kick off proceedings. Okay. We could have gone with Chris, but then we'd have to rejig the order of our slides, which I think will be beyond our, our ken. Um, so just to briefly tell you a little bit about, for those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar with the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution, just want to tell you a little bit about us. Um, the, oh, oh dear, hang on a second. Now, we have a technical glitch to start with, so. There you go, Chris. Why don't you say a few words and I'll go and get, I'll go and get Joel. That'll be fine to, to, to accept to the point when I get to the words slideshow, okay? I think I've played for time. Back to Joe, I think. <laughs> Sorry about this. Ah, good. Working out. Must be me. Okay, let's try that. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so uh, the institution was founded in 1824 um, by a group of, of sort of influential citizens in Bath. As you can tell, 1824, so we're celebrating our bicentenary next year. Happy birthday to us. And there will be uh, a lot of events going on celebrating the history of, of the institution, but also about Bath in general and the various kind of ways in which the institution has been involved in Bath and its heritage. Uh, the original building that's in the picture was in Terrace Walk. Um, originally, uh, the, the, it became a museum in the 1950s, and there were large collections of geological specimens, particularly fossils and uh, geological rock specimens and so on, lots and lots of books. We still have all the collection today, or most of it anyway. Um, and unfortunately, though, in the, uh, in the 1930s, the building was compulsorily purchased to make way for new roads in Bath, because that's progress. And uh, and so the institution moved to the current buildings now, uh, and that all went very well. And apologies to those of a naval background until we got the buildings taken off us by the, the, uh, the Admiralty during the Second World War. And all the objects went into storage. And in a way, the institution, although it carried on, was fairly quiet for a while and then was relaunched in 1933. Uh, the items were taken out of storage and moved back to the building. Now we, uh, we, our aim is really to, to further uh, intellectual inquiry and knowledge. Uh, we have more than 100 lectures every year. Uh, they, co they cover history, science, all these subjects, many more. Um, our museum collection of 150,000 objects is sadly mostly not on display. 
and is kept in our basement. But we have regular exhibitions. There's a new exhibition has just started called Riches of the Earth, which is, you may have seen as you came in downstairs, uh, some of our, our mineral collections. Um, and we also serve as a, as a hub for different groups in the community, um, the Bath Natural History Society, the Jane Austen Society, etc., uh, work with us and, and have space here for their events. Um, now, in the collection, we have one very relevant item. I don't want to talk too much about this because I think uh, Ray is going to talk about this in his talk, but there is a very small bottle. Um, some of you may know of this, I'm sure, uh, and which is supposed to be a sample of the brandy from the barrel in which Lord Nelson was brought back from uh, from the battle. Uh, and it says on the, on the label, part of the liquor in which the body of Lord Nelson was preserved after the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, now, there's some background here, but I don't. I think I'll skip through that for, partly to save time and partly because Ray is going to touch on this. What I will say is that um, there is no definite provenance for this item, although there are some interesting clues about it. Um, and I, I will. I, what's interesting to me is that I was chatting to our curator, Matt Williams, about this. And I said, well, how can we know it's not just a forgery or a fake? And one of the most interesting uh, sort of reasons we have for believing it may be the real thing is that there's nothing else like it. And if it was a forgery, a fake, you'd expect there to be quite a lot of them around in different sizes, shapes, purporting to be the brandy that Lord Nelson came back in, rather like in the... In the Middle Ages, if you collected all the, the the pieces of the one true cross, you could build a forest, you know. So, um, but this is the only one, so it doesn't prove anything definitively. But it, you know, it, it's it's interesting, I think. So, I'll flick through that. You can have a little read of the the, the information there that you know most. Of this background, I'm sure, all of you. Um, and there are some there are some connections with how it came to Bath with the victory after the battle. So um, it's possible. It's possible. We, I'm hoping that if we have a future event together with the Nelson Society, we'll be able to have the actual object here for people to, to look at more closely, but it's just not possible with what, what our collections team are doing at the moment. Um, that's it from me. I would just now like to welcome Chris Brett, um, Chair of the Nelson Thank Society. You. I will be the newest member after this week weekend. So, um, uh, And... Uh, before, before he joins us, I'd like to say also a massive thank you to the, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, but also, he's, it's been a joy to work with Chris in putting this event together. Um, I think you're a wonderful group. So, Chris, over to you. What am I clicking? Uh, yeah, so, so to, to move, it's just the right hand to, okay, to move. Thank you. Um, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, many thanks for your kind welcome. Um, we in the Nelson Society are really delighted to be back in your wonderful city uh, with its many connections to Nelson and the Georgian Navy. And, of course, we'll be hearing a lot more about those during the course of the day um, through Ray Aldous's talk. And we will, of course, experience some of them uh, with the walk that Clive Johnston will be uh, uh, leading this afternoon. Um, however, before we embark on the talks, I'd, I'd like to offer some thanks, if I may, um, in particular to Joe, as, as he said, we've worked very hard putting the program together and Brisley, a fantastic host, and we're very grateful for that, Joe. We're also grateful that you're our first member of the weekend. I'm hoping that you won't be the only member of the weekend. Um, I'd like to thank Nola Wright for helping me organize the lunch with the Bath and County Club, and also obviously to Clive, who's volunteered to lead, lead the walk. And Last but not least, my special thanks to all of you for attending today. I hope it's going to be a really exciting day. Um, before I introduce the speakers, um, and I would just say that I've had a phone call from Andrew Lambert. There's flooding on the line between London and Bath. Train is delayed. Um, it's on the move at the moment, so we're hoping that he's going to be here. I've asked for lunch to be delayed a little bit just in case um, we need a bit of time for him to finish his talk. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Nelson Society because I'm, con I'm conscious that a number of you will not know what we're about. He's our hero. So what are we? We're a registered charity. We were founded in uh, 1981. We have over 500 members and affiliate members. Um, and our organization, as you will see, spreads worldwide. 
we hold meetings and lectures, and we publish regularly a quarterly journal called the Nelson Dispatch. Now, our objective is to advance public education in the appreciation of the life and times of Admiral Lord Nelson and his Navy. So how do we go about doing that? We achieve it by supporting research. Um, some years ago, some bodies were found on an island off uh, Aqaba Bay, which is where the Battle of Nile was fought. And one of our former chairmen was an archeologist and excavated some of the bodies. Um, so again, we've helped fund that research and we'll be publishing the findings of that hopefully very shortly. We support conservation uh, measures, and I'll show you some examples of that. And we also sponsor and write publications. So this is an example of the conservation work we've been involved in. The, the, the ship, the, Le Genre, was a French ship, one of only two to escape from the Battle of the Nile. Um, a few months afterwards, Nelson's Navy caught up with it and captured it. And this is the flag from the Genre. It's held in Norwich, um, but it's in a, as you can see, it's in a, or has been in a pretty parlous state, um, bullet holes and whatever through it. Um, and so we help fund the restoration of the flag, which was the centerpiece of an exhibition held in Norwich just before COVID. This is an interesting situation. Uh, Ray and I were alerted to um, a planting scheme at the Berkshire College of Agriculture in Maidenhead. The trees in the planting scheme were laid out in the formation of the ships at the Battle of the Nile. A number of the trees were dying, diseased, or had disappeared, and, and Ray here advised on the replanting of the ships again in the formation of the battle. Interestingly, there were a couple of wellheads which were in the shape of pyramids, so again, very evocative of the Nile. Perhaps the most important discovery was a painting by the marine artist Peter Monomy. On the left, you can see it in its original condition. And I have to say that it took Ray's wife um, all of three minutes to find out who the artist was. That's, that's, that's how you find a name on a very old painting. Um, but to their credit, the Berkshire College of Agriculture spent a considerable amount of money uh, restoring the painting. And you can see the condition of it on the right hand side there. We've also contributed to uh, restoration, or sorry, or the conservation of items found by HMS Invincible, which was sunk, I think, in the Solent. Um, and HMS Invincible was one of the ships that became a model for the British Navy ships. Um, so we've had a good working relationship with the University of Bournemouth, yes, in, in, in conserving these items. We also publish, uh, as, you, as you've seen at the back, the Bath and Nelson book. Uh, we publish uh, uh, books by uh, various authors in the society. Just draw your attention to the, the one in the middle at the top, and this is purely coincidental for today. That's the original Nelson and Bath publication, and the author was one of our former chairmen, Louis Hodgkin, who's actually here today. So, Louis, do you want to put your hand up so we can see where you are? And I'm sure Ray will be, excuse me, I'm sure Ray will be telling you a little bit more about that publication. Um, one of the initiatives of the past chairman, Graham Capel, was to introduce something called associate plaques. We recognize organizations that have a similar mission to us. And as you can see, here we are presenting one of our plaques to the Nelson Museum in Antigua. I had to go to Antigua to present it. It was... Well, it just had to be done. Um, but on a serious point, it is, it, is a, it is a good thing because we establish relationships with like-minded organizations. We can recognize them. We can work together with them on conservation projects and research projects. Uh, there are other miscellaneous projects. We offer advice, knowledge, and intellectual capacity if pe people are undertaking projects and want our input. Uh, for example, um, in North Walsham in Norfolk, very close to the Paston School where Nelson went to school, uh, there is a heritage centre and they've asked for our advice on putting together a little display about Nelson's early life. Uh, in the past, we've, support sorry, we've supported the Sea Cadets 
and the Jubilee Sailing Trust. Most recently, or relatively recently, one of our major roles has been defending the reputation of Nelson. Uh, as you can see, uh, not all uh, journalists are responsible in the way that they portray Nelson, and there has been a move to uh, suggest that his statue in Trafalgar Square should be removed. Um, we've found ourselves spending a great deal of time researching Nelson's role, if any, in the slave trade, and frankly, we can't really find very much. We think our hero is intact. Um, I would say that um, there was a, a Nelson's column in Great Yarmouth in Norfolk, and the people of Great Yarmouth said they would, sorry, the people of Great Yarmouth said they would tie themselves around the statue to protect it. So I think that's the right spirit. I think one of the things we're most proud of, though, is our connection here in Bath. We were approached by Professor Gilbertson on behalf of UNESCO to develop the Nelson Trail, and you'll be experiencing some of that today. Um, as I've said, we we had a great deal of input into this based on the work of Louis Hodgkin and, and Ray Aldis, um, and I think the result has been very, very successful. I think there's been something like 20,000 plus leaflets that have actually been taken and hopefully used by uh, tourists to the town. We also support other interesting ventures. This is a statue that's been erected in uh, Chichester. Um, Admiral Murray, one of Nelson's close uh, friends, uh, lived in Chichester and they, the, there was a body organized uh, Sorry, a body got together to organize a statue to Murray and Nelson, and that was erected about two years ago, and we helped with some funding towards that. There should be one other slide here. Our most recent venture has been to uh, help develop a resort in Burnham Thorpe, Nelson's birthplace. The Lord Nelson pub has been refurbished, and there's a little outbuilding, and inside that building is what's known as a Nelson map. It's an interactive map of places that Nelson has been. You can press buttons and hear Nelson speak. He seems to have a West Country accent, and uh, if I say that as a Norfolk man, I'm a bit disturbed by that, but that's how it goes. Um, so that's the sort of work that we do. And uh, if any of you would like to, to join us, you'd be most welcome. Application forms are available at the, at the back of the room. Right, now to our speakers. Um, as I said, Andrew Lambert is on his way, hopefully, traffic train permitting. Um, but tomorrow sees the 222nd anniversary of the Battle of Copenhagen. In, I think it's the one in which Nelson famously said he saw no signals, and you'll probably hear a lot more about that later. Now, you'll all know that Nelson, the greatest of Britons, was born in Norfolk, and I'm delighted to say that our two speakers today are other great Norfolk men. Ray is a Norfolk man, and so is Professor Lambert. I, I would just, if I can introduce Ray, he's, he's the society's historian. We turn to him for everything. When and ever a question comes up, it's directed to Ray. Um, I must just point out that on the Brisley advertisement advertising this event, uh, Ray was identified as a lieutenant commander. He was a little bit surprised because it meant that he's actually a lieutenant colonel, so it meant that he'd been transferred from the, na from the army to the Navy and simultaneously demoted. So, <clears throat> so it gives me great pleasure to reinstate Ray to, <laughs> to his proper military uh, role. Uh, he's a lieutenant colonel in the army. So, Ray, would you like to tell us about Nelson and Bath? Come on, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Right okay. All right. Well, between between Joe and Chris, there's not much left. <laughs> They've uh, talked very well about Nelson and Bath, but can I just see a show of hands of those who are not Nelson Society who are here? Oh, brilliant! Good. 
that I, I tend to sort of be preaching to the converted and um no, normally i'm extremely confident of when i'm talking about nelson but coming to bath and talking to bath residents about nelson and bath um is a bit nerve-wracking except i was here just before christmas talking to the royal commonwealth um society um not about nelson and bath they want to hear about nelson in the west indies um but afterwards um somebody came up to me from the audience because uh, i had mentioned nelson and bath during the talk and he said yeah, I've lived here all my life. I never realized Nelson and Bath had any connection. So I'm hoping I've got one or two uh, sort of new pieces of information for all of you here. Um, Nelson was born in 1758. Um, and I, I hasten to add, there's no need to take any notes. You can just buy the book. It's all, it's all, all, all in there. In the end. He's born in 1758 in Norfolk. Um, but by the age of 12, he was in the Royal Navy. Now, that may seem incredibly young, but in the 18th century, that, that's not the case at all. Uh, the younger sons um, of well-connected families would often send the, the sort of 12-year-old boys off to the Navy. Now, um, to do this, um, you'd need a sponsor um, who would be a serving naval captain, who'd be prepared to take them on. So it was sort of nepotism started at a very uh, early stage in, in people's careers. And um, Nelson uh, was one of these, and, and these young boys would go, and they'd be signed on with what was called a captain's servant. Um, and the, the young boys would join the ship, um, as a captain's servant, and then at the age of 13, they quote, they were old enough to become a midshipman. And for those of you who are not naval, a midshipman is basically a sort of cadet officer, a tra trainee officer. They then had to complete six years at sea when they would be qualified to take an examination and uh, then become a commissioned lieutenant in the Navy. So, so that was the, the way up the um, ladder. Now, Nelson's uh, sponsor was his mother's brother, his uncle, uh, a guy called Morris Suckling, who, who was a naval war hero. Um, and Nelson uh, got his brother to write to him because he was too frightened to do it. Um, and, uh, and Morris Suckling said, yes, send the boy along and uh, we'll look after him. And so in 1771, as I said, at the age of 12, young Nelson arrived uh, on board ship uh, in the care of his uncle. Now, under his uncle's very sort of careful eye, uh, Nelson took to the Navy like a duck to water. Um, by the time he was 18, he had served in the West Indies, in the East Indies, and in the Arctic. Um, and on reaching that, that age, he uh, took his examination and became a lieutenant. Um, and then within two years, he was promoted again to captain. And so at, at the age of um, 20, he was the youngest captain in the Royal Navy. And that is, he, he was a, already being identified as a very clever, brilliant young man, but it's influence that has hell of a part to play in this and said his his uncle Morris Suckling was uh, in the center of things at the Admiralty and uh, made sure that N young Nelson uh, was looked after and he certainly was. Um, serving in the West Indies he he took part of, uh, in, of an ex expedition with the army into uh, Central America to Nicaragua and they were basically trying to uh, firstly split the Spanish uh, possessions in two, and also to get a route across to the Pacific, which they thought was possible. Um, now, when Nelson was a young midshipman in, I mentioned in the East Indies, he, he contracted malaria and was extremely ill and had to be sent back to England then. And again, in, when he was operating in Central America, he became desperately ill um, and almost died. He was uh, sent back 
from Nicaragua to Jamaica, where he did some recovery. And then when he was strong enough, he was sent back to um, England. And that's when he made his first visit to Bath. You're probably all wondering, was I ever going to get to, to, to Nelson and Bath? But uh, that's a little bit of background of as how Nelson ended up in Bath. And I just mentioned that painting. Uh, it's the only one uh, contemporary painting of Nelson you'll see with him with two arms. Um, uh, so it, it, it's quite what we call an important painting. Um, so have a good look because you won't see see so his uh, two arms again um, after that. So this poor, sickly young captain, 20 years old, um, arrived back uh, in uh, England. And the reason he went to Bath was that his father, uh, Edmund Nelson, the Reverend Edmund Nelson, um, had taken to spending his winters in Bath his living, as they call it, uh, for the rector, was in North Norfolk. Now, Chris and I um, know what North Norfolk is like in the winter. When you get a northerly wind blowing on that north coast of Norfolk, by God, it's bitter and wicked. And so the Reverend uh, Nelson would say to his curate, stag on, as we used to say in the army, um, I'm off to Bath. And he'd leave his curate in charge and he'd go down to Bath to uh, enjoy the mild, milder climate and the health-giving waters and so on. Now, the Reverend Nelson uh, was well known, became a well-known figure in Bath. He arrived every year, and that's a, a sort of silhouette of the figure drawn at the contemporary drawing at the time uh, of, of him walking the streets of Bath. Now, he was living, he took, uh, he used to take rooms at number nine, Pierpoint Street, for the Bath residents, you'll know where that is and you'll find out this afternoon. Um, but there wasn't enough room for the young Nelson to join him in, in his, his room or rooms. And But he acquired at number two, Pierpoint Street, um, some rooms for Nelson. This was the home of a chap called Joseph Spry, who is an apothecary. Um, and he took, took Nelson in. And with his help uh, and the doctor, local doctor, Francis Woodward uh, from number eight Gay Street, pictured there, um, Nelson began his slow recovery back to health. And at the time he wrote to a friend, and I'll read this out. I have been so ill since I have been here that I was obliged to be carried to and fro from bed with the most excruciating tortures. I am physicked three times a day, drink the waters, and bathe every other night. Now, which of the public baths he was using, we don't know. Um, but it could well have been the, the cross bath, which was contemporary um, at the time. Now, after three months of this treatment, Nelson felt strong enough uh, to um, consider going back uh, to see, and the only way he could do that was by going to London and pestering the Admiralty uh, to give him uh, a, a ship to join. Um, but before he did that, he uh, made sure he squared up with um, Dr. Woodward, um, and he asked Dr. Woodward for his bill, which was presented to him. Nelson was shocked, not by the size of it, but how small it was. And um, he questioned uh, Dr. Woodward as to why the bill was so little after all this treatment. And I will read to you Woodward's reply, which was, pray, Captain Nelson, allow me to follow what I consider my professional duty. Your illness, sir, was brought on by serving your king and country. And believe me, I love both too well to receive more. Now, there aren't many doctors who think that so bad today. Uh, um, now, in the autumn of 1781, Nelson was fit enough to return to sea, um, and he was given command of a frigate, which was HMS Albemarle. Now, after a trip, quick trip to the Baltic on what we call convoy duty, escort duty, uh, he was sent to Quebec again, escorting convoys across the Atlantic. Um, and when he completed that task, he sailed down to New York for further orders. 
by sheer coincidence at New York, um, he met Admiral Hood, who happened to be there before deploying to um, the West Indies. Now, Hood, um, over the years, had a lot of connections with, um, with Bath and lived in, in Bath in number 16, Milsom Street, and in five Queen Square in his time. And he became very much a mentor uh, of Nelson. And serving on uh, Hood's ship at this time, again, by sheer coincidence, was the um, Duke of Clarence, uh, Prince William Henry, um, who became, those of you who uh, know your history, became King William IV. Um, but he was serving as a young midshipman at the time. And it, it's quite interesting that the, um, the uh, Prince William Henry's uh, memory of meeting Nelson for the very first time when uh, Nelson was invited on board uh, Hood's ship. He wrote, Captain Nelson appeared to be the merest boy of a captain I ever beheld. And then on being introduced to Nelson by Hood, the prince observed, there was something irresistibly pleasing in his conversation and an enthusiasm that showed he was no common being. And I think it shows he was a very perceptive young man at that time because Nelson, as we know, was no common being. Nelson uh, saw Hood's deployment down to the West Indies as an opportunity for him uh, to join, uh, join Hood and hopefully get some action. Nelson was never interested in getting what we call prize money, in other words, capturing ships for, and selling them for the money and so on. He wanted glory. Um, and he, he uh, went to the Admiral at uh, New York and said, can I join Hood? And, uh, Hood he, and Hood agreed that he could go, and off they went down to the West Indies. But almost no sooner had they arrived down in the West Indies when there was a peace treaty signed between France and Spain. And so within months of getting down to the West Indies, Nelson was sent back to England. Uh, now, this meant whenever you were sent back without a ship in the Navy, you went on half pay, um, which was not good, obviously, but when you're only on a lieutenant's uh, captain's pay, junior captain's pay in the first place. Um, so... Nelson arrived back in England, and first thing he did was come to Bath. Um, and this, this was in January 1784, because his father was here. His father was always here in the winter. Um, he again stayed at uh, number two, Pierpoint Street, um, and his father at number nine. And um, he found his father in good health. And he himself was also at this time in good health. So he didn't linger uh, for this quick visit to Bath and uh, took himself off um, back to London. Desperate, of course, to get a ship because as I say he's on, on half pay. It didn't take him long and he was given a ship uh, at the back end of 1784. And he was given a ship called the Boreas. And he went to this time to the Leeward Islands to be based in Antigua. And we saw Chris uh, going to Antigua because that's the link. And uh, Nelson spent three years um, based in Antigua. So there's quite a strong connection um, with them, which is very much remembered today. If you get a chance to go, do Nelson's Dockyard is just absolutely brilliant. Uh, the preservation and so on they've, they've done there. Um, now, Nelson's responsibility in the West Indies was basically sort of stopping illegal trade and so on. But Nelson was now 25 years old. And what does a young man's thoughts turn to? And he's 25 years old, uh, is it ladies and getting married. And Nelson uh, thought, I'm 25, it's time I found a wife. Now, up until this point, his love life had been, I think, were disastrous, just about um, sums it up. I mentioned he went to Quebec, um, and in Quebec, he met a young girl, fell in love, and um, he was all for proposing and marry, marrying her, but he was ordered away and uh, had, had to leave. So off, off he went without a girlfriend or a wife. 
And uh, he, just before he was put on, sent on this deployment to the West Indies, he was courting a, a, another young lady. Uh, actually, she was living in France. He was visiting. And her name was Elizabeth Anders. Um, now, Elizabeth was a daughter of a, a, a vicar, rather like um, Nelson. Uh, and she was too sensible to have anything to do with a young captain without a job on half pay and no prospects and no money. Um, and although she was a nice lady, she was not stupid. And uh, she gently turned Nelson down. So again, uh, no wife and off Nelson sailed, sailed to the West Indies. Um, while he was courting uh, um, Elizabeth, his sister, Anne, who was living in Bath at the time, um, sadly died. And um, it's said that she caught a chill leaving the new assembly rooms uh, as shown up there. Um, and she was buried in Bathford Cemetery. That's her grave on the left. Interestingly, the one on the right uh, is connected to her. Uh, apart from Anne, Nelson's other two sisters were both in Bath, living in Bath, working uh, as apprentice milliners. And um, in that grave is Nelson's sister, youngest sister, Kitty's mother-in-law, and one of Kitty's uh, young babies who died in, in, in infancy. Um, and I took that picture in Barthard, you know, uh, Barthard Graveyard, so you can go and visit. It's clearly, it's just outside the, the church, as you, as you can see there. Um, so th th that was quite a sad thing. And, and although Elizabeth was sympathetic to Nelson because of the loss of his sister, she still didn't want to marry him. Um, Elizabeth Andrews quite sensibly married an army officer um, with much better prospects. And she did finish up uh, living in Bath um, and, and in fact died here. Um, now back to dear old Nelson. Um, he'd arrived in Antigua, two failed uh, attempts at finding a wife behind him. And the first thing he did was stupidly, he fell desperately in love with the wife <laughs> of the Harbour Commissioner, uh, Captain John Moutray. Um, now, Mary Moutray, um, I wouldn't say she was a beauty, but there she is. Um, but she, she lovely lady. And when you're a lonely young officer and there's this uh, nice young wife, um, Mary Moutray's uh, husband was 30 years plus older than her. Um, so Nelson obviously thought he might be in with a chance. I don't know. Anyway, she he followed her around like a lost puppy. And, and although she was flattered uh, by his attention and quite enjoyed it, I think, as far as we know, no impropriety took place. Um, and Mary's husband became ill, Captain John Moutray, and they were both sent back to uh, England. And they came to Bath. And um, very soon after their arrival, Poor Captain Moutray died, and if you look in Bath Abbey, you'll find his uh, memorial up there. Um, so there we have Nelson, three attempts, still failing. Um, but whilst he remained in Antigua, he then went on and met this young lady um, who was... Um, uh, to become his his wife later on. Um, now, Frances uh, Nisbet was was her name, and she was a widow, and she had a young son, and she lived on the island of Nevis. Again, I was forced to go out there and take that photograph. Um, and her her um, uh, Frances's uncle was the president of the island council. Um, and uh, she, when she became widowed, she went to work and look after her uncle's house, a sort of housekeeper um, with her young son. She had no income herself. Her husband was a young doctor who died, uh, unfortunately, and had no, no money. Um, so she was dependent on the uncle. Um, 
Nelson Telfer, this attractive, sophisticated young woman who could speak French and play the piano and everything that an officer's wife should be able to do. Um, and this time his feelings were actually reciprocated. And uh, Frances, or Fanny as she was better known, uh, uh, fell for Nelson. The marriage proposal was accepted um, and they were married indeed on the island of Nevis on the uncle's estate. Not long after the marriage, um, the couple were sent back to England <clears throat> um, and Nelson um, came with his wife to Bath. Um, and again, they stayed at uh, number two Pierpoint Street and Nelson talks about during his stay here this time of visiting the baths and so on and being in the best of health. Um, and he talks of visiting the pump room, um, as we all know, overlooking the King's Bath there um, and en enjoyed a short time in Bath. The problem was he was back on half pay. Now, Fanny's uncle had promised that he would uh, sort of support them financially but he was dragging his heels uh, a lot and no money was forthcoming initially. Um, and so they were, they, they were broke basically and couldn't really afford to stay uh, renting in Bath. And so they took themselves off to Norfolk to the father's um, living rectory. And if you look at that map right at the top uh, on the left is where um, uh, Nelson uh, had to, had to go to back to to Burnham Thorpe, and um, poor old Fanny, who had lived nearly all her life in the beautiful climate of Nevis, was suddenly in the wretched climate of North Norfolk, and uh, they were there for five years. Nelson on half pay, um, and Fanny freezing to death, um, and not a happy situation. And to make matters worse, no further offspring came along, which Nelson was desperate, uh, really, for, for more children. And they only had uh, Fanny's stepson, who'd uh, come with them and was at a sort of local boarding school. Um, but joy upon joy, after five years in 1793, Nelson did get a, another ship. This time it was a proper ship. It was a battleship, um, HMS Agamemnon, 64-gun ship. Um, and Nelson went back to sea um, say with, with war declared on France. Um, but he took with him his 12-year-old stepson, Josiah, um, leaving poor old uh, Fanny, not only um, cold and miserable, but alone without, without even her son in Norfolk. And in the um, autumn of that year, 1793, when the uh, rector... Uh, uh, Edmund uh, Nelson took himself off to Bath. Fanny came down uh, with him uh, this time um, and uh, stayed in Bath. The, when it came to the spring and uh, Edmund had to go back to Norfolk, Fanny says, sort of as a soldier would say, bugger that for a game of soldiers, I'm not going back to Norfolk. And she stayed uh, down in Bath because of the, it was lively. Uh, Bath was a, a real centre for the Navy and uh, she was getting news of what her husband was up to and so on all the time, visiting naval officers. Nelson knew she was there in Bath, so he would make sure that the news got back and send letters via, via pe people uh, visiting. And also she had um, connections um, uh, with friends and family in Bristol, which was close by. Um, and so she just stayed in, in Bath. And she found herself a house in um, number 17, uh, New King Street. Um, and there it is. And there's Fanny. Now, for the next three years, uh, Nelson served in the Mediterranean. Now, although he was becoming well known in the Navy for his exploits, it was not until um, 1797 and the Battle of Cape St. Vincent uh, that he, he sort of came to national fame. And in this battle, for those of you who don't know, he captured leading boarding parties himself, two Spanish ships, 
Um, he was not the admiral in charge at this time. He was, he was only ranked as a commodore. Um, but he um, led the things, and this became national news back home, and he became a sort of hero overnight, and he was given a, a knighthood for this. So compensation for poor old Fanny, who had now been at, at, on her own for, for three years or more, um, she became Lady Nelson, so she could strut around the square here, and everybody would say, good morning, Lady Nelson, and, and so on. So she got a little bit of compensation at this time. Nelson was also uh, given the freedom of Bath at this time, and uh, we know this because he he, actually, he wrote to the, the mayor and the council, the corporation, um, thanking them formally uh, for being awarded the freedom. He never actually physically collect, collected the, the award, so if somewhere in a vault there's a scroll for Nelson giving him his freedom, uh, it would be good to find it. But he certainly never received it. Later on in, in that year, in um, 1797, he'd been promoted to Rear Admiral, and he fought in a battle at Tenerife, um, and he was badly wounded, and this is where he famously lost his arm. Um, I took my wife, she poor soul, she has to flog around the world with me, looking at Nelson's things, and somebody asked her, where are you going? And... Uh, she said, are we going to Tenerife? Apparently to look for Nelson's bloody arms, she said. Um, um, anyway, this, this injury was so bad, he couldn't carry on at sea. And so for the first time, and said in, in uh, three and a half years, he was sent home to recover. Uh, Fanny was in Bath. So of course, who turns up on her doorstep? This rather poorly uh, admiral. Uh, with his with his one arm. Um, this is the next portrait of Nelson after that one you saw, contemporary one. And there he is. He's got his one arm now. Um, and uh, this is a very famous portrait. It was, it was by a chap called Lemuel Abbott. Abbott made a fortune out of painting Nelson. Nelson sat for him for this portrait. And then for the, for the next 10 years, uh, Abbott just kept repainting this. As he got older, more medals, he would add the medals and, and, and keep flogging copy, copies of the, oops, so, have I lost a bit? No, still working. Um, and, and so this is, this is the famous picture of Nelson. Sometimes you see him with his hat on, his hat off. It was all from, from this sitting with um, Abbott. Um, there we go. Um, so Nelson turns up on the, on the doorstep at New King Street and has to be nursed um, back to health again by Fanny. Um, his arm was very slow in uh, recovering. Uh, I won't go into the technicalities of it. It's in the book, by the book. And um, the nurse, uh, Fanny's nursing, he, he had a do local doctor here called Dr. Falconer of number six bladdered buildings and a surgeon who is Mr. Nickel of 14 Queen Square here. And recover he did eventually. It, it took quite a while. Um, when Nelson's uh, health sufficiently recovered, um, they moved up to London for Nelson to again badger for a new ship. It's all Nelson ever wanted to do was get back to sea. And in early 1798, remember the injuries in 97, um, he was given HMS Vanguard as his new ship um, and off he went to sea. But before he left, uh, he said to Fanny, because he was a generous sort of chap, how do you fancy a two week holiday? She said, where? And he said, Bath, of course. And they came back to Bath. And this time um, they stayed at uh, number 11, Abbey Green, which you probably all know the locals are as um, the Crystal Palace public house. And that was number 10 and 11. And I think, Clive, it's on the on the route this afternoon. There are, there, I think it's a, I won't, no, I won't go into it. It's steel Clive's thunder um, of going there. But they stayed there for a very nice two week holiday. Um, they went to the theater, the old theater Royal, um, which would probably pass this afternoon as well. Um, and so after that brief holiday, Nelson went off to sea and he left Bath 
for the last time. So that was Nelson's uh, sort of story. However, Fanny um, stayed on in Bath, and over the years, um, uh, even after his death, she continued to visit uh, Bath. And in fact, she was in Bath at number 14 Sydney Place uh, when she received news from the Admiralty of Nelson's death at Trafalgar. So you can see how close the links are uh, with the Nelson family and Bath. Um, now, after the um, breakup of Nelson's marriage uh, with Emma, um, I, 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 and uh, uh, break, break up with Francis over Emma Hamilton. Um, and I, I mentioned that Fanny still stayed on in Bath even after that happened. Um, and I suppose I should mention uh, Emma, Emma Hamilton. She can't be ignored uh, at any rate. She was uh, certainly a character. Um, now, Emma had, had connect, quite close connections with um, Bath. Now, People, whenever they talk about Emma, always put up portraits by George Romney because he, she was his. Rom, Romney was probably one of the, the most famous sort of Georgian portrait artists, um, and he was obsessed by Emma and painted her, I think, thirty or forty times. Um, and that's not a George Romney deliberately. Um, that's by Eliz Elizabeth Verge Lebrun. And the reason I put that one up there is because Elizabeth Verge Lebrun lived here in Bath, the number 34 Gay Street. Um, so I'm keeping the connections going for you. Um, when um, the first time we think that Emma came to Bath was in 1791 when she had just got married to Sir William Hamilton. And um, she gave, it's, it was in the local paper, I believe, that she gave a performance of her famous attitudes. If you've not heard of them, she she was known very well for her performance and she would adopt these poses. Um, they had no television. What else would you, you look at? Uh, Emma Emma stood in and, and did her attitudes. And, and she was supposed to have um, done those in 1791 in the Royal Crescent. She was again in Bath, we know, in 1809, at the same time that Fanny was here uh, on a visit, um, but it is known that the two did stay, stay well clear of each other. Um, now, this, uh, that's really the, the tale of Nelson and Emma and Fanny and Bath. Um, we've seen this <laughs> earlier on. Um, it, it's a fascinating story and there was this Captain Pickering who had the bottle, nobody knows how he came by it. Um, the only connection, that they, at the time of Trafalgar, Pickering was a young, I think, midshipman um, serving in the Channel Fleet. He wasn't at Trafalgar. Um, and so he couldn't have got it from the victory directly. But it is known that at one time he served with Lieutenant Pasco means nothing to most of you, but to some of you will know that he was the signal lieutenant on board HMS uh, Victory who raised the famous England Expects signal. And so Pickering knew Pasco. So did Pasco, who was at the uh, return of Nelson's body on Victory, um, and was there when the fluid was drained off and Nelson was put in his coffin, uh, did uh, Pasco get the small sample? Did he give it to his old shipmate? Well, nobody knows. Um, and uh, as Joe said, uh, is it the fluid at all? Um, it is the only example anybody knows about, um, but nobody knows. Um, but it makes a wonderful mystery story. Um, now, I, I will just conclude now by um, really uh, saying what's gonna happen this afternoon. Uh, the Nelson Trail, um, one chap has not been mentioned uh, and must be, is the late Brian Hall, who's a Nelson Society member. He and I um, very much put this together. And, and uh, Brian did a lot of the legwork. He was younger than me and fitter um, and, uh, and energetic. And, and very sadly, uh, we lost him a couple of years ago. Um, but... It, we put that together and pounded the streets, and it's a super little leaflet and thing. 
much of the information on that leaflet is in the book, the book, don't forget the book. And um, as I said, Clive will be taking you around this afternoon on the Nelson Trail. Um, did I mention this? Um, Bath, Bath and Ab Admiral Nelson. I, again, um, Chris mentioned uh, that Louis wrote the, the original and did all the hard work. Um, and all Brian and I did was tart it up and make it look flashy. Um, and uh, there it is. Uh, it, if you want, want a good guide for this afternoon, I can strongly recommend it at £10 a copy. Is it still £10? Of you cut price. <laughs> £10 a copy. It's a snip. Oh, oh, is it on offer, Graham? How much? Woo! <laughs> Oh, you'll get killed in the rush, my God. Five pounds a copy. Right, right. so the first 10 people. Um, and Andrew's not here yet. Right, well, I'm very happy to take some questions, if, if we've got any. Anybody? Yeah. Is that yeah, what, what can happened? I just ask, apologies, Ray, can okay. I just ask you to repeat the question for the benefit of our online? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so they mentioned the wound to Nelson's arm earlier that he got in uh, Tenerife and, and it didn't heal and he was in incredible pain, suffering enormous pain. You mentioned the two doctors, the surgeon and the doctor here in Bath, and I believe they were the ones that recognised the issue, and it was an exposed nerve. Am I on the right track there? Yeah. Yes. What what the way what they did when they amputated uh, an arm or a limb, they would leave what they call ligatures trailing out of the wound so that it could superate and drip basically fluid out of it un until it stopped and healed. And these ligatures would just fall away. But one of the three ligatures uh, Nelson had uh, stuck and became infected and, and wouldn't. And of course, it, it was cause, causing nerve damage. Um, eventually, it, the, the doctors here admitted that they, he really needs to see a, a specialist. And he went up to London and was treated and they got it away and so on. And it did did recover, but yes, it it, it was not a straightforward uh, healing, so to speak. Uh, anyone else have a question? One at the back. Yeah. Robert Law, um, you spoke obviously uh, a lot about uh, Nelson's dalliances and his uh, uh, marriage. Um, there was another occasion, I think, in Saint Omer in France. And maybe why he hated the French so much was that uh, he went into a hotel and saw a very attractive young uh, waitress um, who turned him down. And that may be one of the reasons he was so successful. That, we were pretty close. That the the lady you saw there, Elizabeth Andrews, that was in Saint Omer. Uh, what happened was. Um, when Nelson was sent back again on, on half pay in, in um, 1783, he um, thought, well, I'm not going to just twiddle my thumbs. I, and as it was peace with France, he was able to go and visit. And he thought, I'd take this opportunity to go and learn French. And so, you know, know your enemy sort of thing. And so off he went. And he was utterly disgusted with France. He thought they were pigs. And he stayed in several sort of places en route and he said this is appalling but he ended up in San Omer and um, because it, uh, even though they were on half pay and so on they wore their uniforms very proudly and walked around and they bumped into a young young chap called midshipman called George Andrews and George uh, had a chat and he said oh you must come and meet my father he'd be very pleased to meet you and they went back to his father um had taken his uh, two daughters and the, and the son um, to France for the same reason, to learn, improve their French and so on. Um, and Nelson went and he met one of the two sisters, one of them being Elizabeth. Um, and 
he thought Elizabeth was wonderful and uh, fell for her. He actually wrote to, he, he had a wealthy, another wealthy uncle, not Morris Suckling, he died at this point. Um, he had another uncle, William uh, Suckling, who lived in London. And he wrote to him and said, look, I found this wonderful woman. She'd make the perfect wife, um, but I'm, I'm broke. You know, he, he was not shy <laughs> in asking for money. And he said, if you could sort of come up with uh, either a lump sum or a hundred pounds a year allowance, that would be just the job. Um, and uh, before he got the answer, Elizabeth realized which way Nelson was heading with their friendship. And she sort of let him down gently. And as I said, you know, a, a naval officer on half pay is not for me. Um, and, and in fact, the, the, his uncle did agree uh, uh, too late to uh, subsidize his, his marriage to Elizabeth. So that, that, that's where the saint um and the, and the being turned down comes in, yeah. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, Ray, you've mentioned his very severe war wound and the loss of his right arm, which is quite quite close to the shoulder, but you haven't touched on his eye. And I don't know whether the recovery of his or his his loss of an eye um, was treated in any way when he was in Bath. Could you advise us on that particular wound? Yeah, his. Uh, of, of course, it's uh, a, a misnomer in a way to say Nelson lost his eye. He 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 never lost an eye. He he lost the sight. Uh, or most of the site in one of his eyes. This was in 1794 in Calvi uh, on the island of Corsica. They were conducting a siege of Calvi and um, Nelson had been ordered to get guns ashore. And in these days, I mean, these guns weighed, you know, three and a half tons apiece. And they sailors would, with blocks and tackles and ropes, get these guns ashore, haul them up cliffs, and they got them into position overlooking Calvi and started to bombard the French. The French, of course, returned the fire, and a cannonball hit the emplacement that Nelson was was uh, operating from, and shrapnel, uh, dirt, and sand went into one of his eyes. Um, and he thought initially he'd lost the sight completely. Uh, he hadn't. He could tell light and dark, um, and that's about as really as good as it ever got. Um, but it then did trouble him the rest of his um, service. And you'll see, you'll find, you, there's the odd picture of him around with his, his hat on with a green eye shade uh, above the eye to keep the sun off the eye. Um, I don't think he, it was ever, I think he, he was looked at by a lot of doctors, but it was, there was nothing they could do for him. And it's thought, had he not been killed at Trafalgar, um, because of the failing sight in his other eye, um, they, it, some doctors think he would have gone completely blind eventually. Um, but yes, it, it, it did trouble him all, all his life, uh, that, that eye. But you, you, you see there's the odd film around with Laurence Olivier uh, with an eye patch and so on. And it's now Nelson never wore an eye patch a la Clive. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to, I think we've had signals flown that uh, Professor Lambert is getting closer and we're hopeful he'll be here before too long. England uh, expects. <laughs> indeed. So we're, we're getting, uh, we're going to have one, one more question from Chris Brett and then We'll take a, a sort of a 10 minute comfort break, as our American cousins would call it, um, and reconvene, hopefully, with Professor Lambert shortly to be here. Right. Uh, a two part question, really, Ray. Um, Nelson was never knowingly undersold by himself. Um, so I wonder if you can explain a little bit uh, about that, because I think it will, those people who are not particularly familiar with Nelson be interested in that but it, it does have a second part related to bath um in light of that um how well known would nelson have been walking the streets of bath yeah i think that's uh chris is quite right N nelson was the ultimate self-publicist um he knew you know to get to the top 
he could only rely on himself. And he made sure everybody knew how good he was. And the classic example is the, the battle where he, um, where he captured the two Spanish ships. His admiral, being a fair sort of chap, had written the uh, dispatches back after the battle and basically said all the captains did very well. And that was it. Um, no mention of Nelson capturing two ships himself. Um, so Nelson wrote a full report, had it witnessed by uh, people who were on board his ship at the time, and he sent it off to the sort of London Gazette, um, where it was published, and an amazed public um, discovered how good he was. Um, and he did, the, he did exactly the same after the um, Battle of Copenhagen. Again, because he was not in command, he was under uh, Admiral Park. Um, and um, he, again, wrote a complete account of the battle, saying that everything was down to him um, and that, that his admiral was useless, basically. I mean, he didn't pull punches. Um, but uh, it, when he was going off to the Battle of Copenhagen, he was supposed to join his admiral uh, off Yarmouth, and he found his admiral in a hotel uh, having a party with his new 16-year-old wife. Um, and Nelson just wrote to the Admiralty straight away and said, this silly old git is partying and we should be off to war. And the Admiralty uh, wrote to the Admiral and said, you know, we've just heard what you're up to. If you're not on the next tide, you're getting the sack. And so that was what Nelson was like. He was ruthless. Um, and when um, uh, Nelson and Bath, um, after the, um, the, uh, the, the battle, um, uh, of Cape St. Vincent, uh, that's when he hit national fame. And as I said, uh, Fanny was here and became Lady Nelson, and suddenly she was being invited to everything, all the, the parties uh, and so on, very, very much so. Um, and then after the Nile, the whole town went crazy. Uh, every shop window was decorated with the, uh, the battle scenes and all the rest of it. And at the theater here, they were putting on Nelson sort of displays and, and so on. Yeah. Oh, he was, I don't think people can understand what a big star he was. I, the only thing I can liken it to is what is when the Beatles came along in, in the sixties, where people just went crazy um, and crowds followed him. He would be mobbed wherever he went. Um, he he was a, a superstar, really was. Sorry, one more. The only person who wasn't in, terribly impressed on his one meeting with Nelson was the Duke of Wellington. <laughs> I, uh, very briefly, yes, uh, Nelson and uh, Wellington met. Um, at um, number 11 Downing Street, which was then the sort of foreign office. And um, Nelson had, uh, had gone to discuss his, his next uh, employment deployment into the Mediterranean. And Wellington had just come back from India, I think. And uh, they were both in the waiting room, uh, wait, waiting to see the minister. And they got chatting and... Wellington thought, who the hell is this arrogant, pompous, whatever, um, and uh, couldn't believe it. And uh, Nelson didn't know Wellington at all, who, who he was. But Nelson then had to, had to use the facilities, I think, and nipped out. But he asked somebody who was that soldier in there, and they said, oh, that, that's um, Duke of Wellington. Oh, my God. Anyway, Nelson goes back in, and... The, atmosphere totally changed and they got on famously and Wellington then said I think I had the best conversation I ever had in my life um, but because Nelson was dismissing him because he thought he was just a sort of common soldier until he realized he was important and might do something for him um, so uh, he never wasted an opportunity okay Ray, thank you very much. Uh, I think you'll probably all understand. I, I, I think you'll all understand why Ray is our historian. He's a, a fund of knowledge. And I have to say the excitement of Nelson being in Bath 
must have been fantastic. And um, we in the society, as you know, are very proud with the association that we have with Nelson and Bath. Um, I've tried to get a hold of Professor Lambert. The train is crawling very slowly. There's been flooding on the line, uh, apparently, at, at Chippenham, and the tracks aren't visible, but it's on its way. It is crawling here. Um, so I think um, we were hopeful that he might be here by about 12.30. I've put lunch back to 1.30, so that he's got an hour for his presentation if, if he gets here. Uh, we'll see what we can do, so please bear with us. Um, in the meantime, if you have any other questions, want to discuss things about uh, Nelson and Bath, Ray is here, Louis here as well, and I'm sure he'd be more than happy to engage with you. So if we take a comfort break for the next 15 minutes and we'll see where we are. Andrew is the Lawton Professor of Naval History and a Fellow of King's College, and I'd like to say he's also a star of television and podcasts. Um, his book, Sea Power States, was winner of the 2018 Gildan Lerman Book Prize in Military History. Um, but I would recommend, highly recommend Andrew's book, Nelson, Britannia's God of War, and it's a must for every Nelson fan and historian must be on your bookshelf and I'm sure it's available from all good booksellers and uh, probably on eBay and Amazon as well. Um, Andrew tells me he doesn't need a couple of minutes to, to relax so um, without further ado Andrew Lambert. Thank you very much. Mm. Wow. I'd like to start with a profound apology on behalf of um, God Almighty, who sent too much rain to the West Country, uh, and the Great Western Rail Company, who found that uh, their tracks were now underwater. Um, one of these organizations will be um, having conversations with me, but perhaps not the other one. Um, what do I want to talk about today? I want to talk about the difference between land powers and sea powers. I want to talk about what Nelson brings to the party and why he matters. And the Battle of Copenhagen, I think, is a very important illustration of why we need to think more clearly about Nelson himself. Nope. Not moved. All right. Some, it's not. It's, it's frozen. Um, excellent. So what we're looking at in the wars of the French Revolution and Empire is a total conflict, a conflict in which one side or other will have major st strategic change in the way that their country functions. They, their form of government will be destroyed and replaced by something more agreeable. Excellent. So... In this war, Britain is going to be fighting as a global maritime economic power, using its navy as its primary instrument of force. France is going to be using a mass conscript army, and it's going to be primarily fighting in Europe, because French armies don't have very easy access to overseas territory. Uh, and Britain will use the world to blockade France, and France will stage a counter blockade called the Continental System to exclude the British from trading with Europe. Does this sound familiar? Uh, so it's two imperial systems, a French land empire, a British maritime empire, and people at the time recognized that this is a repeat of the wars between the Romans and the Carthaginians, the Punic Wars of the ancient world, where the maritime trading Carthaginians fought the military imperial Romans. Uh, and the great book on this was written by a Frenchman, uh, Montesquieu, who came to London after the defeat of Louis XIV's attempt to be a new Roman emperor to understand how these crazy British people had managed to defeat the putative world emperor of the next generation. Uh, Montesquieu said, look, England is just a modern version of the Carthaginians. It's a republic, and it has merchants in political power, and it rules the seas. He didn't then go on to say that the French model had failed for other reasons. But the British understand that they're different. And that difference is available to everybody who thinks about the world in the 18th century. And one of the things we underestimate about Nelson is how well read he is. He doesn't keep copious notes of what he's reading, but we know that he's reading some really interesting stuff. Uh, Richard Steele, Addison, early 18th century writers who are talking about these issues in the era of the Great Wars. 
uh, with the French under Louis XIV. So it's two different political systems, two different approaches to war, and they're going to find it difficult to get to grips with each other because the, where the British are strong, the French are less so, and vice versa. The man who writes about this first in a really structured way is the American Navy Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan, and he uses his book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon the French Revolution and Empire, which ends in 1812, not in 1815, because he thought the wars were over after the Battle of Borodino, which indeed they were, uh, to explain why Napoleonic France lost. And he's using sea power, two words, to explain that. What he's doing is selling the idea of naval dominance to his own country, just at the time when the United States is reaching the point of being a global power, he needs the Americans to think about going out into the world, and for that they will need a big navy. And he's using Britain's success as a model for what the Americans might achieve in the future. And he makes the Americans understand that how the British run their wars is different, and it does involve maritime blockade. The Americans had complained about this quite a lot in the 19th century, he made them understand that they needed to get on board with this project because this was the only way to deal with continental tyrants. And it would be Mahan's argument and the arguments of the British in the First World War and the Second World War that ensure that economic warfare is a key ingredient of grand strategy. Napoleon's continental system is all about closing the continent to external trade. It's about developing a trading block which is hermetically sealed to outside communications. As a result, they develop sugar beet so they can replace West Indian sugar, but I'm still not sure where they got the coffee from. And it's, it's always troubled me thinking about how you wage a total war for a decade without a decent cup of coffee. Uh, Mahan establishes this phrase sea power and he's this is not a word, this is a phrase, because American sea power is having a big navy. British being sea power, one word, is being a, mar a maritime power. What Mahan is talking about is naval strength, sea power as far as the British, the Carthaginians, the Venetians are concerned, is about who you are. It's about how you choose to represent yourself, your cultural icons, as well as your forms of strength. So, Mahan then goes on to write a great book about Nelson, which is a textbook for American naval officers to learn how to be commanders. So he is using the British past to teach the Americans how to go forward. His near contemporary, Sir Julian Corbett, a very, very great man indeed, argued that naval warfare was really quite indecisive because men live in houses on the land in communities. Even sailors have houses and families. They belong to landed communities. So what happens out there isn't going to be that important, is it? And then he twists it around and says, but of course, except in the rarest of circumstances, when things that happen at sea really do matter, and you can be decisive from the sea. Remember, he's writing in 1911. He's an Edwardian Englishman. Britain rules the world. So how can the ocean and global empire be irrelevant? He's being deeply ironic to try and get his students to think more clearly about what's going on in the future. And he too uses Nelson as an exemplar, not of tactical genius or of unbounded aggression, but of sophisticated analysis and strategic direction of conflict. Grand strategy, this is going to be an ideological conflict. This is a war about different political systems. The enemy is not an old regime French monarchy. The enemy is initially a great French Republic and then a French empire, both of which have ambitions to rule the whole of Europe. So total war, one side or other, will go down in ruins. We know what the total wars of the 20th century end in, 19th century is just the same. At the end, in 1814, the French system is overthrown and replaced by the restoration of what had happened before 1790. So it couldn't be a more total change. Napoleonic empire, straight back to Bourbon monarchy. 
And that's what everybody else wanted. France as a nation state ruled by a less than ambitious king who probably hoped he would die in his bed, uh, still the king. And he did. Louis XVIII, the younger brother of Louis XVI, didn't have his head cut off. Yeah. His younger brother, Charles X, got chucked out in 1830, and the French have been messing around with politics ever since. Uh, and as you've probably noticed, they're complaining about their current leader and dressing up as Napoleon or a Bourbon king. So the British mobilize money, industry, ships, skilled seafarers. The French mobilize large amounts of infantry. And it's, that's the comp, that's competition. Every time the French try and get out of Europe, the British can cut them off at the knees, uh, as Nelson particularly did in 1798. So it's a war between Europe and all of the rest. And it will be repeated. The First World War is very similar. Very, very similar. So what does the Navy do? Well, it defends your home country if you're an island and your overseas colonies if they too are islands. And Britain has a very insular worldview. Defends your floating trade upon which everything in Britain depends. Where does the money come from? It comes from trade through the city of London into the state's coffers. And in return, the state builds a big navy which protects the trade which the city of London relies on. So the war effort between 1793 and 1815 is a synergistic partnership between big business, the city of London, insurance corporations, and the navy. Lloyds of London organize all of the convoys. They tell the Admiralty when all the ships are going to sail and where they're going. And the Admiralty, by reply, says, OK, we will send the convoy for them. That is a constant relationship. The, the Admiralty and Lloyds of London are in regular communication all day. All day. This is the biggest relationship the Admiralty building has with any organization talks to the Lloyds of London more than it does to the army or anything else. That is really critical. And the Lloyd, and Lloyds syndicate are the people who are raising all of the capital you need to borrow to wage war. They're the experts on raising money. They are running this massive war debt that the British state is generating to wage these wars. Remember, at the end of this war, Britain owns, owes twice as much against GDP as it does at the moment. And they're going to spend the whole of the 19th century paying that down. So winning wars is one thing, but paying for them takes a century. And that impacts on the way you think about war. If you're going to fight this war, it's going to leave you with a huge debt burden. Is, that, is the war worth it? Is it really that important? This is existential. If the French win, Britain is going to be ripped to pieces. It will be destroyed. So it's worth it. It probably wouldn't have been worth it to fight for some small matter. And then if you command the sea, you can project military force from the sea to secure strategic objectives. And we will see that increasingly after Trafalgar. And I'll give you a good example of that uh, and how that all fits together. And there's a great deal of ideological um, harassment going on. Um, cartoons and caricatures are very powerful on both sides. Uh, the best caricaturist in England, James Gilray, is retained by the government. He's also paid not to lampoon the Prince Regent because it's too easy uh, and it's obviously not good for national confidence. So here is John Bull, a gigantic hungry figure, looking at a diminutive Napoleon standing on the stern of one of his ships, not willing to come out and play. So this ridicule of the French leader is, is a common theme in, in British political caricaturing. Uh, right down to the 2023. Yeah, we, we always do it um, because it's so easy. So battle, what is a battle for? Well, it's about either maintaining or acquiring command. You put your command of the sea to the test by facing the enemy in battle. If the enemy wants to challenge that command, they have to fight you for it. And if you win, you retain command. So battle doesn't happen very often, and most naval battles in the 18th century are inconclusive, and they're part of a strategic grinding process where you wear the enemy down and stop them being effective. Nelson is going to change all of that. This grinding business goes away. Blockade. If you command the sea, you blockade the enemy, you attack their economy, and you can damage their ability to fight. No money, no war. 
War is a, an expensive business. And if you run out of money, as Napoleon will tell you, you invade the next door neighbors and asset strip them to pay for your war. That's how Napoleon funded his wars. Invade, conquer, asset strip. Amphibious operations project power from the sea, usually in the British case for maritime objectives, to destroy hostile naval bases, to secure critical ports. I'll talk about Flushing or Vlissingen uh, on the north on the coast of Holland, which I think is exceptionally important and does fit in to what Nelson is doing. Nelson understands that in a total war, you have to win decisively. If you catch the enemy at sea, you must annihilate them. There is no point doing anything other than fighting a battle that will give you everything in the course of a single day. So decisive battle is a means of speeding up your ability to secure command of the sea. And that advances your national policy and strategy. These things are not separate. Nelson understands what the higher political and strategic objectives are, and he shapes his battle planning accordingly. Nelson never fights the same battle twice because the context is always different. Napoleon always fought the same battle every time because he only had one approach to battle. All of his battles are the same, whether he won them or lost them. Tactics, exactly the same. Nelson, never the same battle twice because he's thinking about very different things. He was not satisfied with securing command of the sea. He wished to enhance it and turn it into something you could use to project power against the enemy. Securing the sea, not too difficult. Harming the enemy massively and changing the strategic balance, that is a much bigger task. And that's what Nelson is going to do. So in 1798, as you all know, Nelson sets off to find out what the French are doing in the Mediterranean. And the French have made a major strategic error. They've sent Napoleon with 30,000 troops to invade Egypt, mostly because the political leaders of France don't trust Napoleon and realize that he will overthrow them one day. So they send him off to Egypt, hoping he will die. Um, the British have got good wind of this, and Nelson works out very quickly what they're doing. He gets to Egypt before Napoleon, famously, and then he has to do a circuit and come back later. But what he does when he gets back is he does not hesitate to launch that attack as the light is beginning to fade into Abukir Bay because he's after a decision. The French are in a rat trap and they need to be annihilated. And he is not satisfied with winning. He is only satisfied with the absolute destruction of the French fleet. Remember, 11 of 13 battleships taken, sunk, or destroyed. And the other two would also be taken by his flagship before he returned to England. All 13. This means the French have no naval power in the Mediterranean. And this strategically means that Britain can now leverage alliances with other powers and start the War of the Second Coalition in which the fight back against French expansion begins. Nelson controls the attack at the Nile. He was in a position at the, at, when they sighted the French to have led the attack, as he did famously at Trafalgar, but he doesn't. He backs sail and drops back into the main body of the fleet to about midway point because he sees the option of going around both sides of the French fleet to speed up the process of winning the battle. Ship on ship combat, it's attritional. You fire a lot of ammunition into their ship when they can't move the ship and there are too many dead and wounded men for it to be effective, they surrender. It's attritional. You can't knock them out with one hit. You have to grind them down. You need to kill a lot of people before you can capture a 74. You speed that up by attacking them on both sides. So Nelson is about speed. He's about decision. And he's the, he's, his flagship is the first ship to attack the enemy on the outside. Right? The previous ships all went round inside the bay. Nelson leads the attack on the outside that doubles up and speeds up the process of grinding the French uh, into matchwood. This is a brilliant performance by an exceptionally highly qualified squadron. There's only one officer commanding a ship at that battle who isn't straight out of the top team. All the others get it. They, they know what Nelson wants. And most of them had seen what he did at Cape St. Vincent, so they knew that he would back them up, that their initiative would be rewarded. He released them to fight their own battle. 
So the Nile, as you can see, Vanguard coming down and engaging uh, outside Spartiate uh, with Goliath along, along the other side. This really does move the battle on quickly. And it sets up that iconic moment when Nelson becomes an immortal. This is what made Nelson a superhero. Uh, the enemy flagship dissolves in a mass of fire and smoke. The battle stops for about 10 minutes. Everybody gets their wits together and then they do some more before they all just collapse in a sleepy heap about two o'clock in the morning. So Napoleon's adventure has been stopped. His army will not return to France. Hardly any of those soldiers ever returned. It, Egypt will eat the French army. And this is a good thing because that's one less French army to fight. There are so many pictures of this, it's not true. J.M.W. Turner's first marine picture of war is a picture of this, but it's a lost image. But everybody knows this is the moment. This is the, the explosive moment. And Gilray immediately launches into the propaganda offensive. These are French crocodiles, but the heads on them are not French. Uh, the dark-hued fellow in the front is Charles James Fox, leader of the Whig Party, the opposition to the war. And the man behind him on the crocodile face is Richard Brinsley Sheridan, who is his chief sidekick in the House of Commons. So these uncommon fierce Nile crocodiles have been brought home because the real point of this battle is it re-energizes the war effort and it makes everybody understand that this is existential. There is no negotiating. The Whigs want to treat with the French. They want to spread their own particular versions of reform. And that's all over. Gilray's first cartoon of the Battle of the Nile doesn't show any ships, doesn't show Nelson. It shows the Whig leadership in a room crying into their beer. Yeah, they've lost. Nelson has defeated them. He's destroyed their political platform. Um, so he is the, the darling of the establishment. Um, the Nile crocodiles, it's a, it's a brilliant invention. The whole thing is all about getting a sense of the sheer achievement and a present to the king. Yeah. This is the disloyal opposition, and they've now been chained, and they will not be significant ever again. On the back of this, the bank raises a much larger loan, and the war effort continues. Britain is not going to lose this war. So Nelson leading the, what, the Nile crocodiles, the French are always portrayed as being bent on destruction. They are the angels of destruction. Napoleon is the angel of destruction. He destroys everything he touches. Um, integrity in international politics, uh, the adult male manpower of France, uh, most of its satellite kingdoms, um, the church, faith, pretty much everything. And uh, Nelson is exactly the opposite. He is about preserving uh, what the establishment that he grew up in. So it's a really critical moment in the creation of Britishness. Englishness invent had been invented long before, but Britishness, that its collective identity, it really is taking shape here in this war. This is the war that made us British. And it's why we need to remember it, because it's shaped so much of our popular culture ever since. Here is the great portrait by Abbott. Um, Commissioned by William Locker. Who's William Locker? His last captain before he was promoted. Um, a protege of Lord Hawke. And one of the deputy governors of the Greenwich Hospital, where he operates as the impresario who's promoting marine art, culture and identity. And of course, Locker is the man who gets Nelson's fabulous letter from Cape St. Vincent and puts it straight in the newspapers. So he's his press agent. He's the the PR guru who's driving this whole sense. Locker is getting a lot of portrait work done. Abbott is also painting other naval officers. He almost has a kind of speciality. And this picture, of course, will be repeated over and over again because of Nelson's popularity. Uh, this is the, the full dress one. There are other versions without the hat on and certainly without the clockwork silver diamond spray in the hat. Uh, only Nelson would have worn that. It says a lot about him, positive and negative, I think. But this is a portrait that also establishes that he's wearing his empty sleeve. He's saying, look at all of this stuff I've got, but my word, it cost me. Yeah? Previously, if you'd lost an arm, you tucked it behind your back. You didn't make a thing of it. 
Nelson is saying, no, it, it, this is expensive. Yeah. I've been wounded a hundred times in the king's battles. The cost of glory. So, Copenhagen, Baltic critical to shipbuilding stores. You can't build a navy without Baltic timber or hemp or pitch or flax. Um, Britain not self-sufficient. Uh, the Russians are now looking to bring the wars of the French Revolution to an, to an end. Tsar Paul, son of Catherine the Great, it has been part of the Second Coalition against France. He then changes his tune completely. He becomes anti-British, and he's prepared to take the flattery of Napoleon at face value and support the creation of an armed neutrality. The object of the armed neutrality is to stop the British using blockade basically stopping the British, stopping merchant shipping on the high seas from neutral countries that are trading with the enemy. What are these merchant ships coming out of the Baltic carrying? Um, naval stores. Where are they going? French dockyards. Should we let them have these, sto these things? No, of course not. These are warlike stores. We would now call them contraband. and uh, We would uh, block them passing in wartime. This is the basis of British strategy. If the French can build big fleets, we're going to fight more battles. Uh, so let's stop the French building fleets. Then the last battle we fight will probably be uh, the one that we just need to win. So if the British concede the armed neutrality's demands, they will be forced to make peace with France on very disadvantageous terms. Very disadvantageous terms. The French will keep Egypt. They will get Malta back. They will get all of their overseas possessions back and they will have the whip hand over the English. It will be a concession of defeat. It would almost certainly bring down the government and shake the monarchy. So this is existential. If the British give in, it's over. So what do the British do? They send a big fleet, standard. They send a diplomatic admiral, Sir Hyde Parker, and they send Nelson as second in command, just in case. It's, it's a perfect situation. If you want to talk, you can talk to Hyde Parker and you can decide not to follow this pattern. Or if you don't, we'll let Nelson loose on you. Um, but of course, Nelson isn't a mad dog. He's a very smart man and he knows exactly what's going on here. He's got a very clear vision of what is happening. The French are on the cusp of winning this war. Napoleon is on the cusp of becoming the main man in Europe. And he sees the Tsar as his great ally. So getting into Copenhagen, in these days, the Great Belt has not been charted. It's amazing. For a thousand years, people have sailed in and out of the Baltic. Nobody ever bothered to chart this. So everybody goes through the Sound, past Copenhagen, and pays Sound dues, which suits the King of Denmark perfectly. That's his main revenue stream. Um, Nelson ordered the Great Belt to be sounded and charted. And so in 1807, when they went back, they used Nelson's charts to go down the Great Belt and come up the other way and surprise the Danes. So forethought by Nelson, as ever. Copenhagen is capital city. It's a major naval base. It's also a large fortress. The Danes are holding the front gate for this armed neutrality, and they're expecting the Russians and the Swedes to come and help them. Funnily enough, they don't turn up in time because the British mobilized quickly and arrived before the ports in Russia were ice-free, and they could sail their ships. So again, strategic understanding, geographical knowledge, curiosity means the British are better prepared. Contemporary chart of Copenhagen. So here is a rough representation of Nelson's fleet. Here are the three ships that are aground, that go onto the middle ground and get stuck. Uh, the Tre Krona is uh, just out here. There's the Tre Krona. And here is the dockyard. Almost all of this is the dockyard. There's the main city. The royal palace is here. And the fort where the Danish crown prince is stationed during the battle is here. It still survives, as does the dockyard crane uh, from the mast pond here. What is Nelson trying to do? What's this battle about? Is he trying to kill everybody in Denmark? Is he trying to destroy Denmark? No, he makes it quite clear. This is not a battle where he releases his captains to use their initiative to annihilate the enemy. Everything is by flag signal. This is directive control. Do nothing without my signal. Um, he's not releasing the talents of his men. He's controlling and restraining them. Follow the signals. 
because he wants to stop this battle as soon as possible because he doesn't want to fight to a finish with the Danes. He wants to persuade the Danes to negotiate, to drop out of the armed neutrality, because the real enemy is not Denmark, it's Russia. Nelson wants to be on the coast of Russia, and the sooner the Danes understand this, the sooner he can go to Russia. So this is a controlled battle, this is a signal battle, and it's a battle fought like an old-fashioned admiral. And it shows Nelson's genius that he adjusts his method to suit this particular set of circumstances. Somewhat stylized version uh, of the Danish line, but of course here is the city right behind. Here's the date, one of the Danish floating batteries. So Nelson is after diplomatic solution and he's prepared to do the diplomacy himself. He's not commander in chief, but the way he acts, he obviously is commander in chief. He just takes over. Uh, he elbows Hyde Parker aside. He knows Hyde Parker and he knows he isn't up to the job. He was commander in chief in the Mediterranean, 1795. Not a great admiral. Decent captain. These are the Danes defending their, their position. And there are the British ships uh, firing into them. And that's the stern of one of the large disarmed, uh, dismasted Danish ships. The real purpose of Nelson's battle is not to defeat the Danish defense line, it's to bring into position the bomb vessels. Bomb vessels armed with one or two 13 inch mortars, they fire at range of about 3000 yards, uh, an explosive shell weighing 200 pounds. And these come down from a high angle and they will break through most defenses and destroy large buildings. The threat of a mortar bombardment of Copenhagen and the dockyard is what Nelson is holding behind his attack on the Danish defense line. The Danish defense line is not of itself important. Removing it allows him to deploy the bomb vessels. And that's why Nicholas Pocock put them in the forefront of the picture, because that's what the battle is about. It's not about Copenhagen. Uh, it's not about the Danes or the British fighting line. It's about these guys. And Pocock knows this because he knows what he's doing. Uh, here's a view from the Danish side of things. So the smoke is drifting. You can see a few British ships, but these are the Danish defense line. And this is the mast crane in the dockyard at Copenhagen, and it's still there. If you've been to Copenhagen, you will have seen it. It's really very, very nice thing to, to see. The, the Danes have extended the, the ground out and, and reclaimed out here. And they also built another fort roughly where this end of the Roughly about here, the, the Provostine, which is why they didn't use the same attack in 1807, because the Danes had built a new fort. So at the critical moment, Nelson works out the Danes are starting to fold. Their ships are running out of manpower. It's the perfect moment to tell the Prince of Denmark that if he wants to get his guys out of there alive, he'd probably better make terms. And Nelson sends the letter, knowing it will take an hour or so to get there and back. So he's had to anticipate, when is the battle going to be over? About an hour and a half. So let's send it now. So it arrives just when the Danes really understand they've lost and they have to make terms. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, and the whole thing, the way he responds when the three ships run aground. Okay, let's just adjust the battle. Let's just move everybody around. It's, it's not difficult if you're a genius. So what does Nelson do after the Battle of Copenhagen. Well, he gets back on board. He heads off to the coast of Russia. And by the time he gets there, everything has changed. Tsar Paul has seized British merchant ships and done a great deal of damage to British trade. Uh, the Russians realized that this would mean the end of all of their external trade. It would bankrupt the country and all of the great landowners. So some of the great landowners get together to persuade the Tsar to change his mind. And by the time they've finished persuading him, he's dead. Uh, his son, Alexander, is aware of this, but possibly not complicit. This happens before news of Copenhagen arrives in Russia, but only just. So by the time Nelson gets to Russia, the Russians have already pulled out of all of this. The Swedes have never really joined. Uh, the Danes have left and the Prussians don't have a navy, so they don't count. Right? So the campaign's over, done. Uh, Trade with Russia resumes. The British are given their ships back. Everything goes back to normal. The naval stores flow into the British dockyards. They do not go to French dockyards. 
little fact for you. Between 1803 and 1815, the French Navy was able to build and finish one battleship in the great dockyard at Brest. It's the biggest dockyard in France. They finished one battleship because they couldn't get the stores. So Napoleon moved his dockyards as close to the Baltic as possible. But that's another story for another day. What did Nelson do when he got home? Um, well, he was given command of the defense of the south coast of England against a force assembling at Boulogne, Napoleon's army, but also a major invasion threat here in the Scheldt based on Blissingham. So the French have a lot of foot soldiers at Boulogne and a lot of small boats, but you can't invade England with foot soldiers. You need artillery, you need horses, you need transport. You cannot rely on capturing that. The only place in Northwest Europe where you could get that stuff on board ship without the British seeing you and coming in and destroying it is here. And Vlissingen is the single most important point in the whole of Western Europe for the wars that we're looking at. When the French take control of what is now Belgium and Holland, they pose an existential invasion threat because they have a deep water invasion base. So if you've got your fleet here, the wind comes around to the east, as it did for William III, you straighten the Thames estuary. Five hours sail. If the Royal Navy isn't absolutely ready, you're going to get some troops ashore. So Nelson is sent to command this, and his job is to explode the threat which the French are using to try and leverage a peace which the French will take advantage from. The French want to leverage the British into concessions which will weaken their strategic position. And Nelson does this in the famous, somewhat ill-fated attack on the flotilla at Boulogne. Bit of a tactical failure, really. They didn't sort of capture much. People got killed. Nelson was a bit upset because uh, Captain Parker was, was killed. Um, it's a huge success. It proved that the only way the French can have any flotilla hanging around off, off Boulogne is by anchoring it with iron cables, packing it full of troops, and making it effectively immobile. The French were able to defend their vessels, but they weren't able to do anything else with them. They, this proved there was no invasion threat. Nelson has exploded the myth of a French invasion, and as a result, the Peace of Amiens is a fairly even truce. The British probably come out of it second best, but not by much. They managed to keep the things that they really want, and when they're asked to give up Malta, which they promised to do, they decide they'll declare war instead. Malta is too important. It was given away by one government, but then the government changed and the new government wouldn't uh, honour that promise. So this battle is really important, rather like Copenhagen, not because of the winning or the losing, but because of the strategic implications. There is no French invasion threat, and this proves it. So there's Vlissingen, also known as Flushing. Here's the Scheldt, and here is Antwerp, great fortress, naval base, well, naval construction facility. This is going to be the center of Napoleon's development of a threat to Britain. So Boulogne is where you can see England from, but Vlissingen is where you sail from. So getting the French out of this part of Europe is Britain's primary war aim from 1794 to 1815. And the, the Waterloo campaign is all about making sure they never come back, as Wellington knows full well. So there's the Peace of Amiens, 1801, balance of power between Britain and France. The French recover some of their empire, but Britain retains uh, critical territory. And when Napoleon occupies Switzerland in breach of the Treaty of Amiens, the British keep Malta. So they both break the treaty and, and war is then declared. Again, the aims on both sides are total. It's regime change uh, or bust. Both know that if they lose, it's all over uh, for them. And the war is going to expand to include all of Europe, most of Asia, particularly the Dutch Empire, which the British conquer, uh, and indeed the United States, which joins in latterly, uh, in a, only to get a bit of a thumping. Uh. So... As you all know, Nelson pursues Villeneuve's fleet across the, the Atlantic. He drives the French and Spanish out of the Caribbean, pushes them back towards Europe. And then very briefly, he's in London. 
And while he's in London, September 12th, 1805, he meets in the ante room of the War Office this young sunburned general fresh back from India called Arthur Wellesley. Now, everybody thinks that Nelson didn't know who Wellington was. This is nonsense. He knew exactly who he was. Um, he'd sent a letter to his elder brother, the governor of Governor General of India, straight after the Battle of the Nile. Uh, Nelson knows who Wellington is. What Nelson is looking for is a general who has the skill and the daring to command an amphibious task force that will be pushed into the Shelt estuary to destroy Vlissingen. That's what they're talking about. And Wellington, many years later, said, I never had a conversation that so fascinated me. And if you know what Wellington is doing about securing the Low Countries from 1814 through to the end of his life, that's absolutely it. This is what they're talking about. Nelson is anticipating defeating the enemy fleet. We, we know he is going to do that at Trafalgar. Unfortunately, he isn't around afterwards. But the follow-up to Trafalgar is not command of the sea. It's the destruction of Lissingham. That's what they're talking about. And we don't know whether Wellington thought he would do that or not. But Wellington, in 1807, was sent to Copenhagen, where he commanded troops in battle. And he was slated to go and invade Spanish Mexico in 1808. But instead, they sent him to Portugal, and he launched a peninsular war. And of course, the Peninsula Campaign is all about keeping the French out of Lisbon. It's only after 1812, when Napoleon takes his troops out of Spain, that it becomes a liberation of Iberia campaign. Lisbon and Cadiz are the only two places in, the, in Iberia that matter to the British sea power worldview. Liberating Spain is an add-on. It's not the core project. As we know, Nelson then goes to Trafalgar. He has more conversations, which fascinate everybody. Um, everybody said this was really quite exceptional, the two nights of discussion of his battle plans. And after Trafalgar, the British have absolute command of the sea. The French and Spanish are not just losing lots of ships, but they're losing the will to fight. They don't want to fight the British ever again. So in 1809, the biggest amphibious expedition of the entire era... 40,000 British troops land on the island of Valkyran and they launch an attack on Lissingen. It's captured after a siege and the entire port infrastructure and all of the raw materials are destroyed. Every dressed block of stone anywhere near Vlissingen is smashed. They take a month or two to do this and most of them get Valkyran fever and come back quite sickly. But as a result one-third of the British Home Defence Army is immediately moved to Spain. That boosts Wellington's numbers, enables him to move forward to the Spanish-Portuguese border. It's a critical strategic section of the war. It's always written up as some kind of failure. It's a massive strategic success. The operational and tactical handling of the army was somewhat pedestrian, and coordination between the army and the navy was not as good as it might be. Had Wellington and Nelson done it, it would have gone a lot better. But it still worked. It was still a very, very positive outcome. It's remembered mostly because the Foreign Secretary and the Secretary of State for War fought a duel over it. And that all of the bad publicity is mostly about leveraging the Secretary of State for War out of the government, not about the reality of this campaign. It is hugely important. And it stresses why Nelson is so significant. So Napoleon still dominates Western Europe, and he's able to expand his domination through the weakness uh, and fallibility of the European powers. The Austrians go down in 1805, the Prussians go down in 1806, and it's only when Napoleon decides that he has to invade Russia in 1812 that he meets his match. Why does Napoleon invade Russia? Does he want to conquer Russia? Is he crazy? Yes, of course he is. But he's not trying to conquer Russia. He wants the Russians to rejoin his continental system because they've been at war with Britain since 1807, but there's no fighting and there's lots of trade because Russia can't live without selling stuff to Britain um, because they need the money and the British can't live without Russia because they need the stuff. So Napoleon says, no, you've got to stop that or else. And the Russians say, well, actually, we can't stop that. We will be bankrupt, literally bankrupt. Yeah. How do you defeat Russia? You attack their economy. You know, don't pick a fight with the Russians on the street because there's lots of them. They're quite aggressive. 
go for the money. So rather than fight the British with money, the Russians fought the French with manpower. And Borodino is, at, by that stage, the biggest European land battle since the Romans, uh, and it's a score draw. The Russians do not surrender, even after they've lost Moscow, because A, it's not their capital, and B, they can't afford to surrender. Because if they surrender, Napoleon will make Russia into just another province ruled by the French. So they fight, and they win, because they've done their homework, and they have massive reserves of, uh, of troops and horses. The Russians got from Moscow to Paris on horseback, and they put a lot of effort into building those horse armies. And the British provided them with lots of money, lots of munitions. Um, Russian guards units all used British muskets because they were better than Russian ones. They used British field artillery as well. So Napoleonic Europe is huge, but it all comes crashing down because the financial underpinnings have been sundered by the British blockade. So, with an alliance of the Tsar of Russia, the Austrian Emperor, the Prussian King, and Britain, it's finally possible to defeat Napoleon. And his ultimate defeat is a joint effort. It's a grand alliance. Britain is never going to mobilize an army to defeat France. But it will support everybody else doing that, and it will hold the seas and generate the the money to make that possible. So Britain's role in this is not to win the war, it's to make winning the war possible for everybody else, if they're of a like mind. What do the British do when the war is over? They make sure that it doesn't happen again for another century. They use the peace process to leverage the French into a security situation where they cannot pose threat. Wellington puts that in place in 1814, and when the French test it in 1815, it works perfectly. The Waterloo campaign was planned in September 1814, when Wellington conducted a grand strategic tour of the Low Countries to set up the defences of Belgium and find a suitable battlefield to engage the French. The field at Waterloo had actually been chosen by Marlborough a century earlier, so it was, it was a good battlefield. And the purpose of Waterloo is not to defeat the French, it's to destroy their army. So Wellington holds the French on the field until the Prussians turn up to finish off the French army. Then he goes to Paris and puts the whole system back together again, uh, which is why Wellington is very important as the follow-on to what Nelson has achieved. Why did the British win? Because they spent more than three times as much on their navy as the French did. You know, there's no shortcut. If you don't spend the money, you don't get the results. And, of course, we spent most of the war locking up every single able-bodied French, Spanish, or other hostile seafarer we possibly could. Uh, human resources are critical. So some Frenchmen spent 20 years in British prison ships. If you're a privateer, you never got released. If you're a naval rating, you might get exchanged, but mostly not. And we built big prisons just to lock up enemy naval prison prisoners. Yeah. The great prison on Dartmoor was built for naval POWs. We haven't got so many of those now, so we put other people there. It was meant to be very inhospitable and very unpleasant and difficult to escape from. It works. The key to everything was the ability to command the sea and use the sea to control everybody else's trade. Now, I won't go into this because it would take forever, but Britain destroys the commercial, financial, and other resources of the enemy, which means they cannot fight effectively, and that affects everybody else. Uh, and that is the root. So the British are prepared to fight for this. In 1812, the Americans say, if you don't stop doing this, we'll go to war with you. Uh, and the British just say, OK, whatever you like. You know. um, what did we do when we signed a treaty with the Americans at the end of the War of 1812? We said, if you talk about this issue, there is no peace. We will not even talk about it. Congress of Vienna, this is not on the table because the British refuse to attend if it is. They will, this is the right arm of the British state. Uh, it's not... Not the Nelsonic version, that's many ways the left arm. The right arm is economic warfare. And fighting for that is what the British do right across the 18th century, right through the 19th century, well into the 20th century. Without that, we don't amount to very much. Artistically, Turner tells us that we've won the Great War by portraying the rise of the Carthaginian Empire. He painted this picture in 1814 after Napoleon had abdicated. 
And it was the star picture at the 1815 Royal Academy show, which was running all the way through the 100 days. Everybody who matters in Britain has seen this picture and they know exactly what it means. This isn't Carthage. This is the rise of the British Empire. And here is Queen Dido, builder of Carthage. And here in the foreground are the real stars of the show, a group of small boys playing with paper boats. Future Nelsons, one imagines. And this structure here is a mausoleum for Dido's murdered husband. But of course, this is an allegory, so actually it's Nelson's memorial. So this is Turner, who's painted literal versions of Nelsonic glory, telling us that there's more to it than that. Carthage becomes central to the way the British see themselves in the world. Uh, this is a great picture. It was not painted to sell. It was painted as a national instrument. Turner kept it throughout his life. He was offered huge amounts of money for it, never sold it. And he left it to the National Gallery on condition it hung in a particular room with some particular other pictures. And it's still in that room with those pictures to this day. Yeah? When you're in the National Gallery, go and find it and you'll realize what he's telling you. And of course, a little later, he comes up with another vast allegory of what all of this means. So, this isn't anything to do with the Battle of Trafalgar. Yeah. This is what it means, not what happened. Um, this doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, the Red Utabla doesn't sink. Um, there are no men struggling in the water, um, nor indeed a, a union. Um, None of this is, is in any way based on reality. This is not an attempt to capture reality. This is an attempt to capture meaning and purpose. Uh, it's a huge canvas. If you've seen it, you, you understand just how big it is. It's meant to dominate the room as you walk in to see George IV. It's a royal commission. It hangs opposite Philip de Lutherberg's glorious 1st of June. And it says, these are the great battles won in my father's reign. And as you get closer to George, you get a couple of Peninsular War battles, and these are the great battles one in under my, my regime. Vast allegorical piece, and uh, the, the absolute definition of why Britain uh, is the master of the seas. Down here, there's an upside down drowning sailor, and he's a direct quote from one of Napoleon's commissioned pictures of one of his great victories at Eilau. So Turner is being subversive. He's saying, yeah, you, you have your Napoleonic glory, but we, we have it too. Uh, he's not allowing the French the credit. Uh, so total war of national resources, sea power is critical, as it would be in the 20th century. It enables Britain to survive and ultimately win with allies. Command of the seas maintained in battles and the destruction of enemy naval resources. Copenhagen, 1807, we take the entire Danish Navy no threat. You, know, that, you improve the balance, you take over the Portuguese fleet, you take over parts of the Spanish fleet, you stop the French getting access. When you catch the French in battle, you wipe them out. Um, you capture them, you reuse their ships mostly, and you make sure they don't get to replace them. So economic warfare is central. Continental system is the antithesis of that. It's a protectionist racket. Uh, the British system is different. Sea power and global empire are the basis of Britain's survival and prosperity. Without command of the sea and the empire, Britain is not surviving this war. They are absolutely fundamental. Nelson becomes the national hero because he delivers exactly what is needed. And he does so entirely conscious of what he's doing. He is not achieving this uh, accidentally. He understands national propaganda. He understands the ideology. He was raised as a son of the church. He understands the use of art. He famously said to Benjamin West out at Beckford's place at Font Hill, it would be worth dying to be remembered like Wolfe was in your great picture, The Death of Wolfe. Um, James Wolfe is Nelson's idea of a hero. He achieved glory uh, and died. It's a very classical trope. All Benjamin West does is take pictures of the ancient world and dress them up in their regular clothes. But that's quite revolutionary. Um, he said it would be worth dying. West did Nelson's death at least three times. None of them very good, actually. Uh, I tend to think the um, the pediment at uh, Greenwich is by far his greatest contribution uh, to that debate. 
He becomes a national hero because Britain absolutely needs somebody to represent the state. And at the time Nelson is operating, there is nobody in the state that, that can achieve that level of prominence or success. Uh, the king is intermittently insane. His sons are a bunch of drunken fools. Um, there is nobody in the army who would be recognized as a general un until Wellington uh, later in, in the period. So you're searching for a hero and Nelson wanders onto the stage and, and you've got exactly what you need. And it has obscured the sublime quality of his strategic and operational thinking. We tend to think about him as winning battles. Uh, we tend to forget that those battles are merely the capstone of long, complex processes. None of his battles are accidental. They're not random activities. They're thought through. And what he's trying to achieve in those battles is thought through. And the results reflect that. Most generals and admirals in this era fight a battle and then wonder what to do with the results. Nelson knows what the results are before the battle has started and has already worked out how he's going to exploit them. What did he say before Trafalgar? He said, I reckon on 20. Yeah. What did he get? 19. And that's without him being in, in effective control. Last point, Trafalgar. What does Nelson do at Trafalgar that's really important, apart from dying? He took out the enemy's command and control with the first broadside. He went under the stern galleries of the Bucentauri and took out the enemy's command and control. He turned a fleet of 33 ships into a leaderless rabble who were forced to fight their own individual battles. That's deliberate. That's why he took that huge risk. That's why the victory took a pummeling on the way in. It was worth it. He'd done his job at that point. He then gets involved in other things. But that ultimately, that's Nelson signing off. Think strategically. Think about the consequences. Only Nelson reckoned there was a storm coming that night. Nobody else noticed, not even Collingwood. It's another level at which he operates, and that's why he will live forever. Thank you.